A pay respects to the beautiful land of the Kulin Nation's people that we are here on this evening. I pay respects to the fact that their culture has always continued on these lands. Their ancestors are still on these lands. Their sovereignty was never ceded on these beautiful lands that they've inhabited for 60 to 80,000 plus years. I make myself known to the ancestors of this land as a Yoda Yoda man. My name is Neil Morris, a Yoda Yoda man. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening to share this powerful and important theme about poetry, its ability to transform. Where does poetry come from? What is its underlying pulse? The use of word to transform has always been necessary to all societies over history. The word often forms the core of how all things can be organized, how things can impact, how truth can be devised. Word can also put together how we obtain many of the all elusive states of mind that we as people are attempting to connect to, to be transformed. Word can come in every form of expression. Some felt or seen less or more. But where does this spill forth from? Where does this arise? How does this continue to exist for some whose use of word itself has been fully oppressed, like my people, the indigenous people of this land? How can these words be inhabited within us powerfully? When oppressive forces reign, the spirit and the words can tend to morph. The spirit and the words can curl, sometimes crumble, sometimes disappear. We stand in indigenous lands where words and spirit are in the root form one and the same thing. Word was used by all indigenous people to compel, to elevate, to continue law through song, through ceremony, through all of our engagements. But many of that became hidden with the oppressive forces that came upon this land and all indigenous people's lands of this beautiful island. The power of word was hidden. These things were so hidden that I could not find them. So my mother was born in 62. And as a baby new into this world was not considered human. As a Yorta Yorta child born into this world not so long after, I was not considered human. Pre-1938 on Kamwagunja Mission, so-called New South Wales, Yorta Yorta people were not considered human. Our tongue, our word, our story deemed as devilish and not spoken. Our tongue placed in mortuaries, our tongue torn out. So we were then upon paths that we know so well were paved for us. Where my mother tongue, Yorta Yorta Lochba, was put aside. That tongue of the poetry that comes through me was severed. But as I grew, I could still feel this. You were with me. You kept me analyzing the literature tinted by insidious intent to wipe clean the poetry of spirit of you, my mother tongue, Yorta Yorta. You were with me 
just as you were with my great uncle Doug as he walked in the chambers of colonial governance as governor, governor of so-called South Australia. You were with me just as you were with my uncle William Cooper when he travelled this land to speak to all of our peoples to rise and petition against our genocide in the 1930s. You were with me just as when our people sat around those Bora grounds singing our sweet tongue into the misty red gum forest there under Galnya Yuri. You were with me. You were gently with me in spite of history, in spite of what history had painted, new renditions, new additions of thinking and forming the devices we were told that we needed and need to know. We were told that we didn't need to know the mystery, but the inkling I had in the whims you give to me, the questions on liberation you would bring to me, as I one conditioned, Described the pre-written visions in scripted in decisions made by few that determined lives that we were living, lives that we were given. Questions on liberation you would bring to me. Even though at that point still, tongue taken out. Tongue speak out, but not from within but not from within the spaces hidden, attempted to be eradicated, no traces, fabricated arrangements written in places erased like water becoming vapors. But you insisted, you inscripted, your pulse never submitted. See him beat and word and rhythm, delivering images of most replenished, our people rising through you, rising through you now. I knew you would never be finished. From the beginning of the motions that you set in, have I forever been stepping in the footsteps of, even though this theft had us left off these blueprints, they just kept on with what they intended. But your spirit, your tongue, your pulse, your rhythm enters still knowing this is where you were supposed to be with us, transforming. Dance spawning on the wrinkled lines of new morning's glow. Even amidst the cold wind blow, I knew you would remain. To chase the mitjima birumja. Mulana ninya genbena lochpana. Word has always been used in an array of beautiful, evocative ways by all people. Those oppressed, those depressed, those stressed those needing to find a way to reframe what has been reframed for them by the dominant paradigm. And we have a beautiful group, group of people here to speak with you tonight to discuss some of this magic. And first, I would like to introduce to you our first speaker of the amazing group we have here this evening, Hawinne. Hi everyone, oh, it's very nice to be with you tonight, see you all. Um, I'm gonna perform one piece tonight uh, called The Chorus. Uh, you can find this poem on a collection of musical spoken word poetry called Pride's Claw on SoundCloud. I'm really honored to be here tonight, I'm excited for the conversation and what it's gonna strike in all of us. So thank you for, for being here. There is a chorus at work here Calling for a return In the echo of flora and erosion of story we meet Have we greeted before? I think so Traveled together even Where is not known to the membrane that stores and gazes to recount in real time I feel like I've steered time on this rock rise Buzzing bleeding into my being like I don't know 
but maybe it did for you here. Perched in position of prayer, a precision so rare, I've never known it like this before. Poetry, God, sunlight, tell me the difference. Can I leave secrets here too? You see, I think the mind, it lies. I am of a mighty people who bless chaos, fear, and wrongdoing in pure love to cure us of the disdain we direct inwards so it can't be true then. The things that mind says about me, if I bear my being, will you hold it tight? Maybe I don't want to fight for change anymore. Maybe I want to love for it. And maybe this be my deepest quest, building homes to rest for. Captive is the matrix and freedom be my main thing. I can feel it pulsating, weaving out, coming back, weaving out, coming back, weaving out, coming back. A call and response song for century twofold. This story so old, settled under sycamore and sea care. One, be branches of a tree under which all ceremony of matter meets. The second is a stick and a song bound together in justice and sisterhood. They resemble me and assemble through you like Adunga Lufdemte, Gara Kesa Sente, Galgalinu Amada, Kong Afsiga Fatada, Samunjala La Ega, Ijila Pesisena, Kara Ke Himbeta. Go ta ta tu si ega. Lost a long time about where to place my love and when to guard my heart. Preached an empowerment that felt like hate inside me. But she held my hand today and made me laugh today. And still today, Oromo say that no cycle turning without one, two, three, four, give. You've laid here a very long time. What can you tell me of this disturbance? I said layers to a shadow. I watched you aim your arrow. The settings on the marrow, its bed be boned and still. Caress our dreams and will shoot. Only not to kill us at layers to a shadow. I watched you aim at your arrow. The setting sun, the marrow, oh, its bed be boned and still. Caress our dreams and will shoot. Only not to kill. Thank you. There are no words to capture how beautiful it is every single time how Winne steps upon the stage and shares world words with us. Thank you for that beautiful sharing, sister. The next 
former artist, poet we have for you this evening is Abdul Hamoud. Abdul is a spoken word artist based in Melbourne by way of Lebanon. He teaches writing classes and workshops for schools and organisations that are looking to explore new avenues of expression and identity. In 2018, he became founder of the Dirty 30 online writing platform, an ever-growing group of currently more than 2,000 writers who want to challenge themselves every April. He's the editor and compiler of the Dirty 30 anthology, a collection of poetry from the page he coordinates. Most of his work revolves around current issues, including the constant state of war in the Middle East, racial divides, as well as the portrayal of masculinity. Abdul Hamoud is next. Since before my memories new dates, I had this one uncle. Every time he saw me slouch or hunch over, he'd walk up behind me and bend me straight. Shoulders back, Habibi. Men walk proud. Men keep their heads up, puff their chests out, and stand tall. Honestly, men take up way more space than they need to. But I had this brand of masculinity beaten into me. I ate my oats, did my push-ups and sit-ups, and walked like the world was mine. My friends and I conquered the tallest spires, beat our chests and roared. Some would call us titans, but others would think us little more than oversized gorillas. So we grew up too fast and wore meme mugs for masks, all in the hopes that we could erase any trace of ever feeling helpless in the past. We, Coca-Cola generation, born on fault lines, shook since birth and told to bottle it up. We, glass mansions with brick pattern wallpaper. We, who were unafraid to throw stones all the same. We, we apologize. Forgive us, for we know not what we do. I know I am still changing. Cocooned within a facade, I am on my way to butterflydom. And therein lies an insect the man I used to be would never have uttered the name of. Along with words like pretty, uh, cute, lavender, uh, <laughs> rainbow, and I admit that I am wrong. See, I, masculine, I'm too arrogant to ask for directions, which is probably why it took me 23 years to find myself. See, I spent too long pretending I am a man to cry, but my bed is a vessel for confessions and tears. It knows both too well. Maybe that's why I spend so long getting out of it most mornings. Maybe we're just not done talking yet, and I'm not done crying. Thanks, guys. Before I get off, very, very quickly, I, don't, I usually just perform and sit down. I don't like talking after I finish performing. Um, but I do have a book on sale. Um, it's a shameless plug part. Just bear with me. Um, the page that you were just hearing about, the Dirty 30, and the anthology that uh, was produced as a result of it uh, is being sold. I'm not sure if anybody else was going to say it, so I wanted to say it in case. Um, I believe it's somewhere at the back. Yes, can someone at the back just nod? Yeah, cool. All right, yeah, so it is being sold at the back. Um, feel free to pick up a copy if you like and read some amazing words from a bunch of crazy good poets. Um, so if you thought this was good or any of these guys are good, Everybody who is in that book is just as amazing. So thanks you for your attention. Appreciate it. Thank you, Abdul, for that beautiful piece you shared with us just then. It's, it's really special to hear the diversity of incredible voices that we have based here in this beautiful city of Naram on Kulu Nation's land from Hawene 
and Abdul, who've already presented to you, we've already seen quite amazing diversity and a very powerful transformational ability with their work. Now, if anybody knows the next person who will be sharing with you this evening, I'm sure you've been impacted and potentially quite transformed by their work. I certainly have. That amazing artist is Sister Zai Zanda. She is a storyteller, an educator, and curator of the Pan African Poets Cafe, an Afro literary matinee of beats, performance, and poetry. Since 2015, Zai has spoiled audiences in Melbourne and Sydney with over 100 performances by African and First Nation storytellers. That's an amazing number, by the way, sister. Amongst career highlights, Zai has co-produced a sold-out Pan-African Poets Cafe event at Arts Centre Melbourne, Black Girl Magic, worked as a youth zone consultant for one of Africa's top 10 international arts festivals and hosted the 2018 Melbourne Writers Festival opening night gala, curated and produced live radio broadcasts and is currently engaged as an artistic associate with Melbourne's Jew West Festival. Let's welcome Sister Zai Sunder. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. Um, and thank you to my fellow poets here. It's just, woo, it's real. I can really feel it. The words are very powerful, very powerful. Every time I, um, I perform in Melbourne, I'm always taken back to the first days. Abdul was there. <laughs> and um, I'm just overwhelmed with joy that spoken word is where it is now in Melbourne. Um, it's poetry by the people. This next poem is called uh, The Conversation is Always the Same. It's a podcast I'm working on at the moment. Um, it's a conversation that I had with my father as I chose this path, and it's a continuing conversation. I'm going to sing a song afterwards that I didn't write, but I like to sample um, songs and stories from black women um, who I admire because that is also part of my tradition. Um, and that particular song is from Chiwoniso Maraire, who is an accomplished, or was, she passed away far too early, um, an accomplished musician. Um, she played a traditional instrument called the mbira, and she was part of, um, she was part of a family that passed on that musical heritage from generation to generation. And um, that's about a thousand years of storytelling in that instrument and the songs that are contained in that instrument. So I'm just paying honor to my heritage. The conversation is always the same. You know, the conversation, well, it's just, it's always the same. And really, it's about his hard work. Because you see, hard work put food on the table and a roof over my head. So of course, it surprises him when this expensively educated law school graduate of a daughter announces that she is going to support the family by writing books. He clears his throat. Fingers toy nervously with the cork in hand and he rotates it over and over and over until you see, finally, story spills out of him. You see his father dying, came to visit him when he too was full of dreams and spoke to him about blood and responsibility about generations gone down in those colonial gold mines and on those colonial plantation fields of my grandmother planting peanuts every single year in substandard soil just so children could afford to go to school and then never, ever have to toil. So you see, they were the generation that was colonized. They were the ones who had had to endure. So, are you a lawyer yet? The conversation is always the same. And we will have this conversation a thousand times a year. 
for the next thousand years. Cause Ndini, it's me. Ndini mwana we evil, it's me, a child of the soil. Va indiro va chindi funga, kuti simbara voringandi kwani sa. They invaded us and tried to destroy us, thinking that their strength could possibly conquer us, the children of the soil. Nasi ndasununguka. Today I stand before you, a liberated woman. Ndoseka mashoko awo ekutuka. And I laugh at the way that they denigrated our cultural tradition. Zitarangundiani. What's my name? Dini, my day. My name is what exactly were you after? Simbarangu. My strength. Diro rakavakanyika ino. My strength built this nation. All those babies we sent to fight in that war for our liberation. I birthed them. I nurtured them. They spilt their blood. And I cried with them. So humble yourself when I walk through this place, when I raise my voice in this place. Dini am I because I am the mother. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was incredibly beautiful. Thank you, sister. We are so blessed to be able to share a story that enables us to reframe that enables us to deliver the narratives that otherwise wouldn't be. And that was such a beautiful piece at doing that. Thank you, Sister Zai. The next poet is a very special guest we have here with us this evening, Kavi Akbar. Kavi Akbar's poems appear in the New Yorker, poetry, the New York Times, the nation and elsewhere. His first book, Calling a Wolf a Wolf, was published by Alice James in the US and Penguin in the UK. He's also the author of Chapbook Portrait of the Alcoholic, the recipient of the Push Art Prize, a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation and Lucille Medwick Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America. Kave was born in Tehran, Iran, and teaches in the MFA program at Purdue University and in the low residency MFA programs at Randolph College. Welcome Kave to the stage for you now. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for letting me be here uh, and for letting me be among you. Uh, this is my first time in the country and it's extraordinary. I feel very among on this stage and off of it. I feel very among, which is not a feeling that I get to feel very often um, in my experience. I'm just going to read a couple short poems. Uh, this is a new one, newer one. It's called Vines. There are fat, wet, 
vines creeping into my house through the pipes and through the walls, gentle as blue flames, they curl into my living. There is ice in my attic, sugar on my tile. I am present and useless like a nose torn from a face and set in a bowl. When I saw God, I used the wrong pronouns. God bricked up my mouth hole. His fists were white as gold. There were roaches in my beard. Now I live like a widow. Every day a heave of knitting patterns and sex toys. My family speaks of me with such pride. Nunesh to Rogan, they say. His bread is in oil. I thank them for that and for their chromosomes, most of which have been lovely. I am lovely too. My body is hard and choked with juice like a plastic throat stuffed with real grapes. My turn-ons include Ovid and fake leather. My turn-offs have all been ushered into the basement. I'll drink to them and to any victory. The vines are all growing toward the foot of my bed. There is no one left to look away. Oh, you guys don't have to do that. I'm grateful to be here, and I feel that coming from you as well. This is called Do You Speak Persian? Um, my first language was Farsi, Persian, uh, but I don't really speak it anymore, which is strange to have all this psychic road work done and then just abandoned. Do you speak Persian? Some days we can see Venus in mid-afternoon. Then at night, stars traveling billions of years to die in the back of an eye. Is there a vocabulary for this? One to make dailiness amplify and not diminish wonder. I've been so careless with the words I already have. I don't remember how to say home in my first language or lonely or light. I remember only I miss you and Shabakher, good night. How's school going, Kavajun? Delambrat Tang Shoda. Are you still drinking? Shabakher. For so long, every step I took was from one tongue to another. To order the world, I need, you need. He, she, it needs the rest left to a hungry jackal in the back of my brain. Right now, our moon looks like a pale cabbage rose. The lampa tang shode. We are forever folding into the night. Shabacher. Thank you for those words cover the, the depth of those seems quite endless. Uh, before we do go into our uh, panel discussion here with you, uh, I also should mention that all the poets here tonight do have uh, books for sale for you up towards the back of the room. So if you'd like to have a look about uh, after we're finished here tonight, uh, feel free to, to look around um, to, to check those out. Um, so we're going to go into a bit of a, a Q&A now uh, with you to talk about this very important issue that has brought us all here uh, this evening. It's such a, an incredible array of poets here tonight. I must acknowledge first and foremost the, the theme of transformation and the use of poetry to do that mm. absolutely clearly evident in everybody's work that I've seen here and I've observed the growth of 
all the, the NAM-based artists here in the past few years, myself, and it is really special to see that we did connect through poetry, but it's interesting where they've gone with their art, for lack of a better term, and where they continue to go with it. And so it's just fascinating to have this opportunity to, to actually speak about the very important issue that all brought us first together as poets and Kavi now here with us this evening. It's a pleasure to have you here with us to have this discussion. Um, how do you feel being here in the country? You've just stepped off a plane um, here into this beautiful city yeah. and sharing poetry amongst us, uh, quite powerful poetry of your own. That must be in terms of poetry and its ability to impact, to step on the other side of the world and share your poetry is quite a physical thing of enormity to be doing. Yeah, um, you ask how I feel and the word that leaps to mind is grateful, which is maybe a little on the nose, but you know, it's, it's sort of, it's this sort of cartoon luxury, you know, to be able to um, share a stage with poets like you all, you know, I, I, to discover work like this living everywhere, you know, um, to uh, the poet Vijay Sashadri talks about poetry being an account of unprecedented experience. Um, and everyone lives unprecedented experiences, but it is so nourishing and good to encounter unprecedented voices. So I feel very grateful. Pleasure to, to have you here to, to share that. Um, and your work, obviously, you speak a little bit about language. Um, you, you first began uh, your time on the physical world here with us, not speaking the English language. Mm -hmm. And you'd cultivated these pathways within your being, within your spirit, the psychic realm as you defined it. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly having that severed from you. In terms of, I'm really fascinated um, from my perspective as an indigenous person who began to find language later in life and realizing the transformational ability of of that and the poeticness of every single word in that language, mm -hmm. you had that and then shifted to the English language. Would you like to touch on that a little bit more? Yeah, us? yeah, and I'd be interested to hear your and other people's thoughts on this too, because I think that there is something almost mitochondrial in me that responds to the rhythms of mm. Farsi. Um, you know, uh, there is something really, really different about the way that I hear it. Um, I'll also say I grew up uh, and my family would pray in Arabic and it was a language that nobody in my family actually spoke. Uh, we spoke Farsi and then English, but, um, but we prayed in Arabic. So it was sort of this magical language that was just reserved for the divine, right? I'm getting goosebumps mm -hmm. talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I knew that that meant that, you know, from, the, from when I was two, three, four years old, um, I knew that it meant that if I sort of contorted my body in these positions and made these sounds, these beautiful, mm -hmm. mellifluous, charged sounds come out of my mouth, it was a way of thinning the partition between me and the divine, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I still mm -hmm. basically have that relationship to poetry, right? Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily need to have a one-to-one -one linear denotative understanding of you know, mm. the pigeon in this poem is my mother. And you know, I, like I don't mm. think about poetry like this. I'm not mm. particularly interested in poetry that mm. thinks like this. Mm. Um, uh, but I know that if I make the sounds come out mellifluously mm. and earnestly enough, mm. it'll thin the partition between me and whichever d divine I'm hoping to address, mm. whether that divine be, you know, a spiritual entity or whether mm -hmm. that divine be a beloved or whether that divine be the body or whether that divine mm -hmm. be this sort of one brief and wondrous life, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be interested to hear other people's relationship to that too. Absolutely. Uh, and in you describing that, it was really fascinating and impacting to see how you linked in movement mm -hmm. into your words. And mm -hmm. I could assume subjectively that it did have a link to something quite amazing like that, which is really incredible to see and experience that. And thank you for sharing that, yeah. which leads me across to 
the incredible sisters I, mm. um, just listening to Kavi there, it began to get me thinking in terms of how you also have uh, historically at times used movement in your work, but also the use of song. And it's ever so natural the way that comes in, which is intriguing in the sense of at what point is there a line between poetry and other types of vocal expression? Is that all poetry to you when you're singing within your song or, or something else, perhaps? I think, uh, I definitely think that it's, it's all poetry. I don't, mm. I don't tend to um, categorize mm. uh, song, poetry, dance. <laughs> mm. It's all part of expression. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's getting back to, I think those roots that are, that are within us. Like, I think when we're given the gift when we're born with the gift, when that gift of the word is within us and we're born with it, and I think all of us here are born with it, and that's our unique purpose within our family circles and within our social circles is to bring that forth in its fullness. We, we, we have within us, coded within us, all those notes and all those tones that are unique to our, our cultures. You know, that's thousands of years of coding within our bodies, you know? I think people often talk about like epigenetics and they go, oh, the trauma, but don't forget this other stuff too. This other stuff too that comes through. So it's like tapping into that. And like what you're saying about, you know, being able to contort your body or to reach a note in a certain way or when, when a certain tone comes through, like finding my natural voice. Because I spent so many years in, in good... Uh, Christian choirs, mm. <laughs> singing particular mm. tones and particular rhythm patterns. Mm. I had to break that. Mm. I had to decolonize mm. my relationship to sound. Mm. And I had to accept that certain tones are beautiful. Mm. I never heard them that way before. And so that came with playing this instrument that Chiwoniso Maraere and Dumisani Maraere mm. have played and passed on these songs that are thousands of years old from when mm. our people journeyed down from Persia to Zimbabwe. So like there's all this history in there that you won't read in a book either, you know? So as you're doing this exploration, I know it's going on a tangent as a storyteller, but you know, there's, there's as you're exploring tone and you connect and you, that, that veil between you and the divine thins. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you become immersed in a timelessness Mm. And there's a connection there and it's beyond like you're no longer in a geographical space mm -hmm. you know none of these western concepts of nation and time and linear whatever actually mm -hmm. exists or boundaries or anything it's just like I'm mm -hmm. I'm in it and I'm feeling it mm -hmm. and there's no need for a um, translation, mm -hmm. Some, you know, like if I'm really able to just like belt it out and sing it, mm -hmm. you will feel what I have to say, like if I'm able to fully immerse myself in it. Um, but I've also found that that immersion can only come through following protocol. Mm. You know, so... That's mm. kind of where I am at the moment is mm. coming to terms with being here and understanding mm -hmm. what that actually means, you know, because, you know, as a migrant, you step into a space and so often that space is defined in white terms. Mm -hmm. But if we're to be real, this is actually a black country. So when I'm stepping in here, I have to step in and meet, allow my blackness to meet the blackness that is here. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's through that and, and allowing that to happen that I have, yeah, I think the veil, yeah, that's, that's the work. Mm, incredible, <laughs> incredible. And definitely this, the things you touched on in terms of, of tonality, that makes me think a lot of your work, how in uh, your, the, the tones that you use in your work, the way you get into the little angles and very particular points 
to utilize a particular tone within your work is is a clear standout feature of everything that's amazing about your work. Would you like to touch on a little bit how you go to those places within your work and what that does mean to you? And thank you, Sister Zai, for sharing that. That was incredibly beautiful also. Yeah, that's um, it's a really interesting question for me to ask myself. How did I get mm. to the place where that became such a mm. moment that mattered in um, my recitation of my work? Mm. I think of before that was a really, uh, I guess, evident style of my delivery. I would really scream my poems. Mm in a way that really felt powerful to me. Um, and if I think of where I was as a being at that time, I felt like every space that I would enter, everywhere that I would really go, be that within my own house or within my um, understanding of my identity in, um, in this context, in the context of being diasporic, I always felt like I had to, I'm here. What's up? Like, mm, let me mm, let me let mm. you know. Um, and being able to allow myself to be that gentle and be that quiet on stage mm. is my relationship to this exact thing that we're talking about right now of the thinning of the veil, the relationship to the stillness and the silence um, in life, but that we get to experience so intimately on stage and I hope allow others that witness our work to be able to experience. Um, to let myself play with those moments and feel full in those moments has been parallel with the journey of accepting myself as full, okay, like this, no matter who is watching, who is not watching, um, what I'm being praised for, what I'm not being praised for, um, if I'm saying the right thing or not saying the right thing as, as in accordance with what people see and what I have said previously, that's been a huge journey as well. You know, when you, you make a particular version of yourself known to the world and you say, this is who I am, and then as happens, we change. And then you gotta, you got to go, okay, it's like so many people out there that think that, that that was me, that what do I do with this new version of me? Um, and it's really interesting for me actually thinking about that in the context of that's why we come to poetry, that's why I come to poetry in, in search of a catharsis, in search of a release. We're sitting with the moments that within like the vastness of life, the everyday things we all experience, we're sitting with moments that sometimes perhaps we, we don't want to look at, um, but we're doing that for, you know, to write the poem. And in doing that, that very process is what brings us into the transformational um, mm. point. Um, mm, mm, mm. So yeah, that, that's that's what it is. For mm. me, it's what it's been for me. Mm. The um, it's fascinating how you were talking about. It might be the work that you're seeking to to go to 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 transform other things or transform yourself, but you can be on that journey of creating the work which then takes you on another journey. Mm. And the transformation can purely be just about yourself, not necessarily anything beyond that. And um, you can come to the point where you don't even want to do poetry, you come to the point where you might do poems that are more songs, still poetry, <laughs> but in a format that is known more as song, mm. or we can do it in a different way that's quite conversational. Mm. We can come to a point when we don't verbalize in words in one language or another, um, which is another hour of discussion. We probably need to talk about that as well. Um, we had some really interesting conversations earlier um, behind the stage uh, about you know our journeys as poets, and you know we don't always feel like the word is the way that we can express ourselves to be transformative. Um, but Abdul, your poem that you shared with us earlier, it is one of my favorite poems. It has been since the first time that I had the opportunity to hear that. Um, so many layers of decolonization in terms of um, identity structures that you were expected to go into within your own upbringing 
and um, what's culturally accepted within your peoples. How has using poetry been for you within uh, where there's been certain patriarchy structures in place that maybe didn't really lend itself to you deciding to go down the, the path of uh, becoming someone to explore poetry? Oh, man, I'm digging the questions. Um, that's broad. I feel like I have very high achieving parents. Um, and so I was always, much like many other ethnic and non-ethnic families, um, kind of been expected to take a certain route, go a certain way. And if I didn't, like I've, I've, I've had to sit down for that are you sure this is the right way to go? You know, um, is this really going to make money for you? I'm like, I've had to have those conversations um, several times. And it's interesting that it's always kind of created this, um, I'll show you, you know, like I, I've always had to write from that perspective, not just from my parents and the men in my family who don't understand the concept of writing down your feelings and then performing them to other people who have feelings. Because <laughs> why would we? Um, it was also, I will show you to the people who doubted me outside of my family. And it was an, I'll show you to the teachers who told me that I wasn't going to, you know, do much in this area. And it's an, you know, it's an, I'll show you to, um, you know, Islamophobia, and it's an I'll show you to people who think that, you know, males are one kind of way, and it's an I'll show you to this, and it's it's a, I always feel like I'm pro trying to prove myself, mm. and I'm starting to right now figure out whether that's a good thing or not, because mm. it mm. does lead to what Soretti was talking about, that, mm -hmm. like, you, you know, you got to beat your chest and, mm. and, and, and stomp your feet and walk into a place and be like, I'm here, I'm about to show you. Mm -hmm. But what did the audience do to you? You know, mm. like what did what did no one here needed me to show them anything? You guys mm. just wanted to hear me perform. So I'm starting to get to a point where I'm wondering if it's affecting my art, and I'm wondering if the constant like I definitely agree that revolutionary poetry is absolutely necessary. I just me personally like much respect and much love to anybody who does that for a lifetime. You, you like you're killing it. You really are. Mm. For me personally, I don't know how much my soul can take, like how much I as a human being can take of being revolutionary and sticking my fist up before eventually I'm like, there are other things, mm. like there's more than just trauma in you mm. and you get to talk about that. So I'm trying to be funnier now. I'm trying to smile more. I'm trying to like recognize the fact that like, like it's a, it's a dark turn that like I can be happy too. It's like I'm not just a sad guy, you know. I don't just yeah. do broken-hearted mm. poetry. I don't just do, mm. you know. Why do you hate me and why do we hate them and why do this and why do, like it's not just that. It's a bunch mm. of other stuff and mm. Mm. yeah. I feel like it's that patriarchal structure mm. from mm. such a young age that um, uh, conditions you to be a fighter. Mm. Um, which is really ironic because that's as patriarchal as you can be sometimes, mm. you know, um, is that in me trying to combat that nature, mm. you become this roaring, stomping, deep-voiced, you know, baritone guy who's telling other people what to think. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes, a, it takes time, age, and a lot of people, you know, telling you that you're wrong and you disagreeing with them to eventually realize that maybe it's time I, I, I decolonize that. Mm -hmm. Decolonize what you thought that you decolonized in the first place, but you actually mm -hmm. didn't. Um, <laughs> yes. And that's where I am. Well, and I'm not, I'm not, it's not that, this is where I am, it's where I'm in the process of, mm. yeah. Powerful insights, yeah. brother. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, what, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> the being, as revolutionary, mm. the like just letting yourself feel all the things that come across your your landscape of ability to feel I and mean, what it, yeah is for me what I'm um, exploring and really owning to be the most revolutionary thing that I could do and and offer as um, 
as a sense of like, this is possible to anyone else who's in the space that I am in, a, in, in that moment. And through that, I've had to ask myself like, what is it that makes me love being on stage and, and doing this thing? It's the ability to feel without restriction, to be the ability to feel maybe the same thing, let's say same, the same event in life, the same poem, but in a different way because it's a different moment and that always being exactly what is needed for where I am in, in that time and space. Mm -hmm. I think it makes you a better revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Like if you're going to be a revolutionary but you can't explore mm -hmm. every feeling mm -hmm. on the spectrum, mm -hmm. you're just angry. Like you're just an angry revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And there are other <laughs> kinds of revolutionaries in the same way that there's other kinds of everything. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's like expecting to walk into... I don't know, the, the Safeway and just being like every single cash register, like every single registered dude is going to be the same thing. Like you're all going to, no, each person has a different life and they mm -hmm. feel different things and they do different things. Mm -hmm. And as such, we feel different ways and there's other ways mm -hmm. to quote unquote fight the power um, mm -hmm. while still having good mental hygiene and sleeping mm -hmm. enough. You don't need to survive on Red Bull and you know <laughs> go to sleep at four o'clock in the morning. You can get eight hours sleep, shocking. Um, you know, you can see friends and you can have fun and you can play video games and you can, mm -hmm. you know, be a human being. I feel like mm -hmm. by being- That's the one, yeah, being, hum being, being a human, human being. being. Really get Absolutely. to know what it is to be a human being. Yeah. And that's, and I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just like, crying here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, look how far we've come. Uh, yeah. We've tapped into our feminine. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm. um, and it's, yeah, it's that, it's that being human, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because it's like colonization dehumanizes mm -hmm. and goes so far. And so you, you don't even realize that you're engaged in the dehumanization yourself, either in the way that you represent others or the way that you are and you be in the world. So it's like that, that resistance to the dehumanization <laughs> is the revolution. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. I've got all my feelings here. I'm tapping into all of this. But I really respect the anger, though. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really powerful, like, launch, you know, moment, just that point of those really powerful, intense feelings and emotions that I feel like we are able to sit with and process Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, because we, we, I don't know, we're just those people. We're those, we're those people who are exploring all those different aspects within ourselves. And so the anger, we can go, that's a lot of anger I'm feeling right now. What's going on here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, yeah. you know yeah. but it's a beautiful starting point. Like you can write that angry poem and then look at it and be like, wow, okay, great. Mm -hmm. I think um, I love performing angry poems really quietly. Mm -hmm. Because there's a power in that too. Because we, because I mean, for some of us, you know, like black women, anger has been taken away from us. Mm. And so being able to explore that space is so empowering as well. Mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, there's so many brilliant things being said. I'm just trying to keep up. Um, <laughs> I think that being a rev, I think that being holistically emotional and being is actually vital to being a revolutionary, not being flattened into someone who is just sort of like always militant or always mm -hmm. um, angry or always this or always anything, right? Mm -hmm. um, because I think that when that happens, people get it in their heads that the only way to affect change mm -hmm is to be this kind of superhuman. And so they say, mm -hmm. I can't do that. It's great that they're doing that, but I can't be that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Whereas when we're honest about ourselves, when we're honest about um, the depths of our personhood and we're honest about the fact that while yes, we are angry and we are organizing and we are doing this and we're doing that, you know, we also get hungry and fall in love and feel mm -hmm. sleepy and laugh at cartoons, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that then it allows people to see themselves in us and it says, oh, maybe I could do something like that, right? Then maybe I could be a part of this thing too. Maybe I could contribute. Um, so I think that it's not only important for our own sort of psychic hygiene, but I think it's important for our revolutionary hygiene too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think, it's, I think it's vital for that. Um, I'll also say there is a way in which 
writers of color tend to be read and listened to first for their political and social content mm -hmm. um, and second for their craft. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, you can, you can hear just from what you've heard on, on stage today, you know, from the people who are sharing the stage with me, you know, they're, they're, writing, they're writing and performing really, really effective work, AFFEC. Um, but it's also like sharp as hell, you know? It's also like these are, these are really, really accomplished performers who are doing a really, really dope thing really, really well, right? And I want, I want to take a second to just like be in awe of that for a second, uh, out loud, because I am, uh, you know? Um, uh, they're doing a really, really difficult thing really, really well. And I think that that's something that we should applaud and be really excited about too, to be in the company of people who can do this, what we just saw, you know, it's astonishing. Third and final thing, I've always had this dream one day of making an anthology of just Muslim poets, but all of the poems have to be about like skateboarding and food and sex, you know, no one's allowed to have like yeah, a bond, you know right. what I mean? Like, just like, just Say like, no yeah. Okay, that's it. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean that. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Kavi, for those words. And I share that sentiment as I sit here on this stage feeling very blessed to hear these perspectives by my fellow uh, poets of Narm and also brother here with us today to hear the journeys that we've been through and the use of poetry, the things that you said, Abdul, in terms of um, in a decolonization process of going back against the patriarchy, but then realizing that you had to find a different way to go about it. The journey of Tone with Sister Zai and Soretti with so many other amazing things um, in terms of how you inhabit the space as someone who expresses those words. The biggest overwhelming thing for me, hitting, hearing all of this about the transformation taking place is that it has been by doing the work that we have seen what the transformation can be. And that's just something really special to acknowledge here amongst us, here on this stage. Uh, we have run out of time um, for you here this evening, but we will, we have longer. Yes, <laughs> we do have questions for you in the audience. Um, if you would like to um, ask anything of us here, are you welcome to fire away with your questions? Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much. Look, I, I sense, I don't know whether I'm really totally wrong, I sense something happening here, which is a bit like, I don't know, it's hard to frame it, but there was an old saying, you shall hear the truth and the truth shall set you free. Mm. And I'm thinking, no, there's something different happening here. You're hearing mm. a transformation, mm. multiple transformations, and you, st you start transforming. Mm. It's like this fire, there's five fires up there and we're a bunch of trees down here and we're starting to catch fire too. Mm. <laughs> oh, that's that's so the cool. thing about transformation. Transformation is catchy. Mm. Um, it's more than just revolutionary change or mm -hmm. superheroes like Bob Dylan expressing the truth of the time mm -hmm. and we just stay passive. No, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. We don't stay passive. We're catching a fire of transformation. I could be totally wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so Beautiful. much for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a generous thing to receive, uh, to receive words well and it's not passive and so you've given us a gift too. Thank you for that. Do we have any other questions burning to be asked? Um, I just have a question about. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I just have a question about uh, the people who write poetry. I've attended a lot of slam poetry over the years, and it always seems to be, I guess, the domain of people who are um, oppressed or. Um, people of colour or people who are marginalised. Is there any place in SLAM for people who are... who don't have a kind of oppression of some kind? 
Uh, do, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. I love, like, I understand it all comes from a place of of oppression or, or a place where you have been, where there are issues. Um, but I wonder whether there is a place for people who just want to write. Um, mm. do, do you know what I mean? Like, mm. I, I, mm-hmm. I hope I'm not question. sounding really awful. But uh, I've, I've heard people celebrate life with their poetry mm. mm-hmm. and what you're doing is celebrating your lives, which is wonderful. But for someone who feels like they haven't had much uh, to discuss in their life, do you encourage them to take on poetry? Can I take that? Sure. Um, I have a question. Can, can we have the mic back, please? Thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions for you. Um, do you think white people have been oppressed? Not really. Um, What if I told you that only oppressed people can oppress other people? So, like, um, only bullies will bully? Um, Why bully? No, that's what I'm saying. So you are saying, and and I agree with that, only only people who've been bullied will bully. So people who have been dehumanised will dehumanise. Yeah. Yeah. And by dehumanisation, I mean also stereotyping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we often find that many of the stories that circulate about people of colour are stereotypes. Mm. They just turn on the media, African gangs, typical, you know. Um, But that comes because it's feeding a fear. Mm. And that fear means that love has been taken out of your heart. Mm. So you've been oppressed. So I think what we have is a city where people actually need to start creating okay. spaces to heal from their internalised whiteness mm. Great. and stop taking in and consuming the oppression of other people, which is like the pornography of violence. Mm. So that's, that's how I see yeah, it. That's great. That's great. Thank you. That, that answered the question. Yeah. Could I... Could I say, too, I think that that's so extraordinary. I think that that's so valuable and useful. I'll also say, you know, there's this great Russian defamiliarist credo to make the stone stony, Viktor Shkovsky said, to make the stone stony, meaning what art does is it undoes the damage of habituation, right? So, you know, you see a billion trillion stones every day. How many trees have we all seen today? We've all seen dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of trees today, but you couldn't describe any one of them with any sort of fidelity or integrity, right? Um, What art does is undo that damage, right? It makes the tree tree tree-y, it makes the stone stony, it makes the oppression oppression oppression-y, right? Um, And it is true that there is a certain defamiliarist perspective granted to people writing from places of alterity. If you are sitting in a golden throne, you know, eating a giant leg of lamb, drinking mead out of your golden goblet or whatever, uh, it feels altogether fitting and proper that you should be eating your, you know, and drinking out of your golden goblet. But to the person with their face pressed up to the window, looking inside, getting rained on, starving, it, it's very strange, right? It seems very strange that you should be doing that. So there is a defamiliarist perspective afforded to that person, right? This said, there are ways to get at that defamiliarist perspective. There are all sorts of ways to get at that um, that don't have to be born out of trauma. I think that um, it's reductive and painful for young artists to hear that you have to have some sort of foundational trauma in order to create. I think it creates a dangerous cycle for artists who think that they have to be living dangerously or living um, in ways that endanger themselves in order to become artists or they have they think that they have to be financially unstable, you know, this sort of thing, that sort of thing. Um, you know, again, we come back to this phrase, make the stone stony. You know, you can you can become intimate with the strangeness of a stone by literally stoning someone, right? This is a very, very violent way to come to that knowledge. Or, you know, you can be a parent. I see children in the children in this room, and when a child puts a stone in her mouth thinking that it's food, you think to yourself, oh, stones do look very much like tiny morsels of food, right? Like that is another way of defamiliarizing, right? So, so much of the work that I do today is trying to figure out healthy avenues to that, that kind of defamiliarization, right? And I try to teach that to my students too because I think that it is incumbent upon us to break the cycle of thinking that 
we have to sort of perform our traumas, especially as writers of color, that we have to come up and like perform our foundational traumas for largely white audiences, right? I think that that's a core, that's, I think that that's a kind of strange vaudeville. Um, and, uh, and I think that there are other paths up the mountain. I think that there are other ways to make the stone stony. And it's focusing on... And I'd, I'd like to, you know, just pick up on a comment that you made earlier. We need to look at the technique that we're bringing. Like, we're doing some really revolutionary stuff here. We really are amazing. You know, and we've put a lot of hours into this. It just didn't happen overnight. But then all people hear is, oh my God, your voice is so amazing. I'm like, nah, gee, you missed the point. You know, mm -hmm. so it's we need to start focusing on the entire picture of the mm -hmm. art that is being created in the city. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, to really value and appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm always taken back to um, Chinua Achebe's book. Um, what is the title of that book? Things fall apart. You know, and how phenomenal that was. You know, from just actually writing a story from the perspective of the person who is always just the background character, you know? So, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, that's, that's hard. That's hard to live up to. Those are standards. And I'm constantly thinking of that and thinking of Toni Morrison and thinking of, like, all the amazing Indigenous writers that we have in this country as well. There's a phenomenal amount of work out there. Mm. And, um, and all of that teaches us how to, how to humanise how to become human again, mm. connected, community, reciprocity, generosity, all the values that underpin where we are, if I may say that, mm. but yeah. Mm. Hi. Um, so I'm a teacher and uh, a lot of my students don't feel like poetry is something that's accessible to them, not in the sense of being able to get a poetry book, but being able to write poetry because they kind of feel like I've, I've got to be really, really good to be able to do that. How do you, I think all of you teach uh, in different sorts of capacities, how do you inspire and motivate your students to feel like they are good enough and capable enough of writing poetry and you don't have to be a certain person or a certain type to write poetry? That's a really, that's a really beautiful question and it's something that I've asked myself as well in the process of teaching. Um, I would what I've said and what I would what I would share is um, that you can't really convince somebody that they are what they don't think that they are, but you can give them sort of a new perspective, a new way of looking at this thing that they have deemed inaccessible for whatever reason that makes it really applicable to the lives that they live on a daily basis um, in a really practical sense. The exercises that I'll often give are or well, the way I'll describe poetry is, you know, capture the feeling of being in this room. When you look outside and you see uh, you know, whatever it is that's outside the tree or the people playing or people talking, what would you, what story would you give to those things existing in one, in one space of your vision? Like you seeing that, isn't it amazing that, you know, you have the ability to give that a whole interpretation? Um, and then in the process I found of them reading that work in a collective environment and receiving praise from the person they've said is a poet um, and, and does this for their living, slowly, slowly there's this emergence of confidence in you know, what they would previously have just thought is just my thought on what per that person outside there is doing. But now I know you're saying that's what creates a poem. That's what gives um, meaning life to something that otherwise would have just, yes, been a person having a conversation outside, but that is you know, your job as the poet. So, yeah, for me, it's been repositioning the importance of, of one's um, perception and interpretation of anything and everything that occurs. And slowly, slowly, I think they become that person they thought they couldn't become, the, the poet that is enough, the writer that is good, the performer that is powerful. I think that's definitely a great, um, a great way to do it. Like, that's, yeah, that's awesome. Um, one thing I tend to do personally, I've always found that history is a really good a really good place to start for me personally. Um, and since 
modern day history is the only history that a lot of kids care about. Um, and thankfully a lot of kids love hip hop. I tend to gravitate towards that. And I just say, well, you know, you must have heard of Kendrick Lamar, you must have heard of Jay-Z, you must have heard of this, you must have heard of that. Well, let's look into what makes them so special. And when you look into it enough, you're eventually gonna find someone that they, that they relate to, whether it's a rapper or otherwise, that um, wasn't that special. You know, wasn't, wasn't, it's obviously special, but not, there was nothing about them that was any different to the child sitting in front of you telling you that, you know, I'm not gonna be good enough. Like I have to write the best poem ever the first time to be able to make this work, you know. Um, one, you know, to one of the uh, what is to be the cons uh, uh, considered the, the greatest rapper of all time, Tupac Shakur, had the rose that grew from concrete come out, I believe, after his death, uh, a book of his poetry, and we can revere the man as much as we want to. But when you read through some of it, some of it's just technically not good, you know. It's but it's beautiful to read the fact that that was the case because that's what the book is about, it's about a rose that grew from concrete, it's about a beautiful thing that grew from something that is imperfect. And so some of the poetry is going to be amazing and some of it's going to suck and that's okay because that's what humans are. And so to show a child that and say, look, your favorite person sometimes sucks and sometimes is great is a lot like us and if they can do it, so can you. It's just about how much hustle you want to give it. You know, what you believe in so much so that you want to write it down, give it cadence, give it a story, give it this, give it that. Who are you willing to ask? How many people are you willing to sit down in front of? How many documentaries are you willing to watch? How many books are you willing to read? How much do you want it versus somebody else? That's the way I, I mean, some people don't like that hustler mentality. I love it. I, that's what I thrive on. Like I thrive on how much do, like I, I know I want it. And that's, I know that it identifies me because I know that I want it. You know, and if a kid wants it, then they're going to write that way. If they don't want it, I would not personally recommend saying, well, you know, you're not cut out for this. You just kind of look at what, what they do want instead, you know, and redirect their energy towards there. Mm. That's my personal outtake. Um, everybody has a story and everybody has a voice and every voice has a unique rhythm. Mm. And so I just, you know, ask them to really sit with themselves, their ideas, the way that their voice flows, and to produce from there, and not try to be anybody but themselves in that, you know, just to really be quite authentic, and that, you know, then there are other tools that you can use to kind of like teach them technique and all this sort of stuff, but that's always the starting point, is like, your voice is pretty unique and spectacular. Like really listen to it. Really listen to the rhythm of your voice. Think about the ideas that you have. What are the things that are important to you? Let's write about that. Let's start there. And then we shape it. These are some of the tools that this person's used. Let's check out this YouTube video. Why did you like that line? All right, let's break that down. This is how they did that. That's what this is called technically. You can do it too. So starting with the self and then giving them the technical manual. Mm. Sisters, I, you spoke about uh, that stillness, you know, that people can come back to. And once they begin to find that with their voice, they can then find a beautiful way to go about their poetry. And things that you, you said as well, Abdul, in terms of the person who is out there doing the things perceived as the greatest or the most revolutionary didn't start in that place. They started in that place where there was some sort of a container that they were on the other side of or stuck within and they went beyond that. And although some of these people have enormous platforms, essentially as we've kind of explored throughout this conversation, they found their power which was their humanness, which was not necessarily given to them in these post-colonial societies that we live in. And I think that's a beautiful thing to, to have been able to share tonight, largely is the transformation process. It often comes from stilling yourself to be able to begin to go through that and explore that. And it's been an honor 
to share in this with my guests here. A winner to my left, brother Abdul in the middle, sister Zai, and our brother Kaveh coming out here with us today from Turtle Island, also known as the United States. What a beautiful evening. Thank you all for sharing this with us. <laughs> Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. <laughs>